hearing from you and also have a conversation. Since we are not able to pull down the chair, so we have to make some adjustment today. So our speakers will uh, stand and speak uh, even when you they take up the question. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, we're doing a sort of tag team lecture for you this for the next few minutes, and um, hopefully we'll have a good time for discussion. It'll be a lecture about telling stories, stories that transform, stories that cause revolutions, one story at a time. This is the moon. Next slide. This is the moon. That's really not. <laughs> Slide. Slide. There, thank you. This is the moon seen through barbed wire in Robben Island, um, South Africa. And there is a story behind that picture, as you know. We want to tell you the story of Pooh. But before we get to Pooh, there are a few other stories to tell you along the way. On 17th July, 1980, a self-destructive and very troubled 17-year-old became a follower of a first-century manual laborer from Palestine. Learning to follow Jesus had two very strong effects on the teenager. First, the kid thought, if Jesus is indeed Lord, with all the economic, political, justice, and love implications of that claim, then of course the whole world needs to know, really, the whole world. Why would one ever keep it a secret? The second thought that came to the teenager was extreme anger at a church that had gone 17 years keeping that very secret from the teenager's life and that family. Well, that teenager's questions and feelings regarding that transformation are right on. If Jesus is all that we say he is, all this about justice and peace and love, then why in the world would we want, not want everyone to know? Why would you or I or the churches we represent keep this gift to ourselves? The teenager was quite right to be angry. If we're not going to take the challenge from this kid seriously, then we might as well pack up our stuff and go home. If our prayer at Busan is God of life, lead us to justice and peace, are we really prepared if God answers our prayer? The themes of mission and evangelism and all the challenges associated with them are not new to our time. But we would argue, taking the cue from the teenager, that evangelism is indeed the queen of all Christian ministries. A strong claim, perhaps, yet one that we joyfully affirm and which provides the need and rationale for all that's going on here in Busan. However, the lecture today isn't about offering a justification for that claim. Rather, we let the teenager set the agenda, and we'll see how the church and Christian organizations have taken on the challenge. We will look at some selections of primary texts taken from some of the major mission and evangelism conferences over the past century. The full texts are in your reader. Most of these texts themselves are within a very Western context. That's one way of telling stories, though it's not the only way. It is often how the West tells stories, though there are always stories behind the story. Obviously, we don't have time for a full analysis, so we will have snapshots of groups or people who have shaped Christian history in the past hundred years, such that you and I stand here and listen to the questions that are asked by a troubled child, questions that a troubled world needs the church to address. The um, next slide is of this gentleman. Uh, hopefully, most of you will recognize John Mott. He uh, 
he was the brain, the powerhouse uh, behind Edinburgh 1910. He asked some deep questions. He was a passionate man. He was a servant and a leader. He experienced horrors of the two world wars. And he knew the revolutionary nature of Jesus. And he desperately, desperately wanted the whole world to know about this Jesus and wanted the church to return to her calling to serve the world, to be present to the world as Jesus was. And this ethos, this shaped the uh, mission conference that we've heard about this morning of Edinburgh 1910, and that helped lead to the founding of the WCC. As Rosalie said, the longer quotes are in your reader, but there are two quotes coming up on the screen now. Uh, the second one of which in particular is worth memorizing and taking away. The first one is from 1910, the mission, the statement to the churches. Uh, it has become increasingly clear to us that we need something far greater than can be reached by any economy or reorganization of the existing forces. Sorry, can we have the next slide, guys, please? Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing out to save time, but I do want to draw your attention to that second quote. Uh, from a book by Mott called The Larger Evangelism. Uh, and his argument is very simple. The larger evangelism needs a larger message. Nothing short of the integral individual and social gospel will suffice. This was years and years before um, the, the, the squabbles that emerged in the 1960s that social gospel against personal salvation. So we're going to move on to that in a moment. Um, there are lots of criticisms that can be made of Edinburgh 1910 uh, and the still colonial mentality that did um, dominate much of the WCC at the time. Like us, John Mott was a product of his time. But he nonetheless took seriously those two questions uh, posed by the teenager. Where is Jesus in this, and what is the church doing about it? Now, one of the functions uh, of the documents that get produced from time to time, and it's important to bear in mind that behind each document is a story and a backstory. They illustrate how different churches and organizations function in terms of their understanding of authority. How authority is perceived within any given church is directly related to that what is theology of mission and evangelism. Thus, an understanding of Christian evangelism can be based upon, for example, a papal encyclical, or it can be determined by the Sunday morning sermon of a Moravian pastor. And this will also help us develop together an understanding of different methods and different ways of decision making and working within the various branches of the very broad community that claims, in one way or another, the name of Jesus Christ as Lord. Edinburgh 1910 sent two messages, both of which, according to the minute at the time, were unanimously accepted by the conference. Um, we've reproduced both of those in your, in your notes for you. The text of their time, the language used is gender specific. It reveals clear assumptions about the stronger races of the West. It uses a language of strategy, the imagery of warfare. It talks about study, survey, operation, forces, occupation, utilize, consolidate. All those words, management speak words, are there. So there's much to criticize, but the passion for world evangelization, which addresses the questions of the teenager, is very clearly addressed. And these, we would want to suggest, are the most important parts of the messages to the churches. If Jesus is really Lord, it requires a new order of life of a more arduous and self-sacrificing nature. And the task is for every Christian and from every congregation. And the text shows an awareness of the significance of the next 10 years 
which were to become a turning point, sadly not driven by the passion of churches, but by the onset of the First World War. This passion for world evangelization, the evangelization of the world in this generation, which was a catchphrase, it was pretty well lost in some sense by the time we get to Uppsala in 1968. The way that happened, the story behind it, 1950s, uh, many different voices were finally being heard. We hear the strong, rebellious and masculine voices of Latin American liberation theologians, the softer chants of Vatican II, and what's described here as the cacophony of the evangelicals, leading to a more nuanced voice in the Lausanne movement, and the slightly self congratulatory voice, voices from the WCC. <laughs> I'm glad somebody picked that one up. Uh, there are ongoing historical influences that shape these various developments, including the Cold War as it played itself out in Africa and in Asia, the establishment of the United Nations, and so on. But by the time we get to sort of 1950 to the 1980s, the emancipation of many former colonies, the growth, the significant growth in world human population, and the connected crisis in ecology, the world was changing. There were turbulent years, and churches and Christian organizations struggled to find their place with a fast-changing world. And therefore, within the period of that, we look at two texts very quickly. The first one is Uppsala, slide six, in 1968. Again, we're not going to read the whole thing. But what's worth bearing in mind is that at the Uppsala conference, uh, it's not so much necessarily what was said, but sometimes it's what wasn't said that provoked significant controversy. The process leading up to the assembly and the process within the assembly itself highlighted growing differences in the theological understanding of mission and evangelism. And the division was particularly sharp between some representatives of evangelicalism